Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, hey, uh, my name is Clint Loveman. Uh, I work on the production mapping team and a couple other teams um, at Esri. And what I wanted to go through a little bit today is talking about high quality printing uh, through ArcGIS Server and through the web and go through some of the workflows and actually give a couple examples of customers that we've worked with and a, um, a sample application that we put together that uses production mapping server uh, to allow for some of these types of maps to be created. So the first thing I'm going to start with is I guess kind of a little bit of background on uh, printing through web applications and, and printing via server. And I'm assuming um, I'm assuming most people here in the room understand some of these things, I guess, but I'll go through it anyway just in case, just to got to give some foundation and give some background, because that'll actually give some context of where, what I'm going to present a little bit later on, how it relates to this stuff. So uh, I think it was back maybe 9.2 or 9.3 or 9.4, I can't even remember to be quite honest, where we started providing the ability to print web maps through server, so web applications being able to print. And a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, we talk about printing, but realistically it's not really printing, it's really exporting, right? It's exporting out primarily to a PDF or a TIFF or a JPEG like that. And then you can take those files and, and do a print, I guess. But primarily it's printing and exporting. Um, and so there's kind of really three tiers with the ArcGIS platform if you want to print from a web application. And the first one is if you install server, you get this uh, you know, out-of-the-box GP print service. So as soon as you install server, uh, there's actually a service that gets kicked off and starts running automatically for you, and it's the out-of-the-box print service. And if you've ever noticed it, it's a GP service. It's a print service that's just there and it's running. And the idea behind that print service is really to allow uh, yourselves developers, application developers, who want to host something to allow those applications to do uh, simple exports from those web applications via server. So it's really designed for small format, synchronous and token based uh, web services and that's really what that's designed to do. So the other thing you can do, kind of the next tier up from that, is you can actually configure your own uh, GP service. So there's a, there's a GP tool that gets installed uh, in desktop and server and it's the same one that the out-of-the-box print service uses, but what you can do is you can extend it. You can actually put in your own map documents, your own templates, into a particular folder on si inside of server, and therefore you can actually modify the out-of-the-box print service to have customized layouts, you know, larger formats, so on and so forth. You can make it, you publish the service yourself so you can make it asynchronous, and it can handle HTTP secure service calls. And again, it's primarily designed for doing large format. So you've got the out-of-the-box print service. You can actually spin up your own print service using the same GP tool. And then there's the third use case, which is even more advanced, which is using Python. Uh, I'm assuming most people here use Python. Python developers, raise your hand. All right, cool. Uh, so Python's really great. Uh, one of the cool things about it uh, specifically is with the Arc, uh, ArcGIS Python site packages, they can work in desktop and they can work in server. And really one of the main use cases of why we developed the Python site package is to do a lot of uh, map automation type of workflows. And again, you can think of that primarily on desktop. But one of the really cool things is Python, you can actually publish your own GP tool that's based on Python using the ArcGIS Python packages, and then you can modify and create maps using that. So the general idea is if these tools are too limiting, you can do almost anything you want with Python and build these very sophisticated custom maps using Python and bringing in other modules that are not even necessarily ArcGIS Python modules as well. So you can do uh, manipulation on the layers, you can do layer replacement, you can modify the renderers. One of the other really uh, useful things that you can do with Python is you can modify the page layout. So you can modify elements on the page, you can change the text, you can change the position, you can do a lot of things like that. So Python is really powerful in that kind of a three-tier approach. So when you want to print from a web application, there's a couple of, uh, a couple of options there. So specifically, um, we put together a sample app which we call Product on Demand, or POD for short. And really what it's designed to do is perform really high-end cartography over the web. And from a, from a development point of view and from our ArcGIS platform point of view, probably the best way of thinking about this is 
this is an extension of that third tier. So again, we talked about the out-of-the-box print service, we talked about the uh, customizing your own print service with the GP tool, and then writing a Python script. So this really takes that writing a Python script and extends it even further. Um, and what it allows you to do is actually have outputs that are high vec all vector, high resolution outputs. Now, normally, uh, when we've stood up systems for customers or, or worked with customers to do these, these pod implementations, um, normally what happens is it's kind of a workflow where a lot of customers who are more traditionally doing hard copy mapping and they want to move over to the web, it's kind of a nice transition. So a lot of the maps that are actually being produced with this type of application are really uh, more traditional hard copy maps. And those, the symbology and the complexity of the details and the features don't actually display well in a web application because they're really slow and complex to draw. So normally in an application like this, and I'll give a demonstration here in a minute, the application, the map that you see on the screen is not the map that you're going to get. Just again, because primarily what you're generating is this very high quality vector image. So a lot of the pod type applications, they're not what you see is what you get. You kind of get an overview of where you want to build a map, but then what happens is it hits the server, hits the vector database, and then generates this high quality PDF that you can then take and print and do whatever you want with it. So that's kind of a little bit of a distinction. The other thing that we do is you have ability to control the symbology a little bit more. Uh, you can have a finer grain control over setting the, setting the scale and the extent of the maps and defining the map sheet boundaries. And again, we talked a little bit about the page layout. So you can see here in a couple of the screenshots, some of those layouts are pretty sophisticated, lots of complex surround elements. All that's capable uh, within this kind of uh, workflow and, and application. One of the other kind of workflows that the application is really useful, useful for are what we call like just-in-time deliverables. So we talked about, um, you know, these, a lot of the implementations of these things come from customers who would do a lot of uh, traditional hard copy printed map type of workflows. One of the other real advantages to this is these are not PDFs or images that are, you know, cached or exported two months ago that are sitting on a file server. These applications usually set up is that they're actually pointing directly to your vector database. So for example, if you have an SDE or a file geo database that's being maintained, these maps are generated on the fly. So when a user goes in and requests those maps, they actually hit the database, pull the latest and greatest data, and the whole map is actually compiled at the time of a request. So when you click export, it doesn't spit back immediately, it takes a little bit of time to process because it actually has to go get the latest and greatest data. So as long as your data is up to date, then your maps are up to date as well, so when a user requests those. So again, just kind of some of the ideas uh, from kind of a more of a high level, kind of a marketing story, if you would, is when would this type of application be useful? When you, could you stand this up and when does it make sense for, uh, for a workflow or for a customer? Again, if you have really sophisticated, compelling maps, again, think traditional hard copy maps, lots of uh, really complex symbology, lots of features, complex layouts. This is a great tool for that, those types of maps. Um, it's another way to kind of complement web maps. Web maps are great, very powerful, very usable, but again, a lot of times, uh, especially people going out in the field uh, where uh, Wi-Fi and internet connections aren't necessarily reliable, there are still a lot of industries that still rely on hard copy. Uh, forestry guys, you know, uh, people working on utilities out in the field, they want, they, in addition to the web map, they want a backup. So this is a great tool to allow to generate and, uh, and deliver those products to those field workers where, uh, where web access is not always guaranteed. Uh, again, real-time cartography, I mentioned that already. And then behavior-based mapping. So again, we have this ability to control how the map gets generated, automatically calculating the scale, defining the page layout for you. So if there's some automation there that can also be enabled, again, depending on the workflow. So I mentioned a couple, um, a couple of customers that we've worked with. I'm going to highlight probably this one here in particular. Um, we work with the US. Anyone here from the US Forest Service? No? OK. Because um, they could speak to it probably uh, better than I could. So we work with the US Forest Service. Uh, this is a few years back now. And what they do, just a little bit of, of a background on kind of their mission, is they maintain geographic data over the national forests in the United States. 
and the idea is they collect it and then they distribute that geographic information in a number of formats. Spatial data, you know, the shape files or whatever it happens to be. But again, one of the key deliverables for them are still maps. And they kind of got out of the map making business, right? They don't produce hard copy of maps and print them and stick them on shelves. And when you go up to the Forest Service, you say, hey, can you give me a hard copy map? That's not how they work anymore. Really what they have is this on-demand system. So for example, what happens is if they have field workers, for example, within the US Forest Service, there are a lot of biologists and conservationists, and they're doing field research. And they actually go to this tool and generate the maps at the time of request and bring these into the field. So that's kind of how they work. So again, uh, the general workflow is inside the Forest Service, they have a large enterprise database that's being maintained and updated by their staff. And then they have this front end application that's used for actually generating the maps when people are taking them into the field. So they'll go in and say, hey, I want a map over this area. It'll hit the system. It will then query the database that's updated, maintained, and the map will get generated with the latest and greatest features. And those maps can be then taken electronically as PDFs or TIFFs. They can be printed, you know, you can go send to a plotter, and you can actually offset them. So if uh, you need to go to uh, an actual press and have, you know, thousands of things printed, uh, this application allows for that as well. So just a little bit about kind of the, uh, the scaling of this type of application and what it can support. So again, specifically with the US Forest Service, you can see here the number of maps, uh, the different kinds of scales, and the number of requests that are actually hitting. This is, this, these metrics are a little bit old, but it's a pretty heavily used system. Um, and we've done similar uh, engagements and work with other customers, uh, specifically here in the US. Uh, just to mention, uh, we're doing a project. Anyone here from the USGS? All right, so we're doing stuff with you guys, something similar as well. Um, so we're actually doing a project with the USGS today to, to implement a system very similar to this for the USGS. Uh, we've, uh, we, last year I was introduced to a customer down in Australia, um, um, a utilities company that actually had taken our sample application and stood it up and did utility mappings as well, which is really cool. So there are a number of customers, it's not only uh, large, let's say national or federal or state mapping agencies, but utilities and forestry have, have applications uh, that can use this type of technology as well. So instead of just talking about it, uh, let me show you the application so you can kind of get a better sense for what it does. Um, so just a couple notes. Um, this URL, you can, if you want to take a picture of this slide, it's a sample app. Uh, anyone has access to it. It's over a limited extent, but you can hit it and you can play with it and see what it looks like. The other thing, uh, it's primarily the application is written in the front end is JavaScript and the back end is all Python and all the source code for that sits up in GitHub, so you can go have a look at it as well. So you can, you can download it and play with it and, and stand it up. And we've got some pretty good documentation, I think. Uh, there's, a, there's a PDF in there that talks about how it's set up, how the install, and there's a configuration file to stand it up. And I think there's like 20 pages of documentation, which is uh, pretty, pretty detailed. So let me, uh, let me start the application here. All right, so again, here's the URL at just uh, pod.arcgis.com, and again, there's a, there's a notification. It is just a prototype proof of concept sample application, so just to let you know that. Um, we only have a limited set of data over the area, but again, this is kind of how the application is set up, and you can plug your own data into it. So the general workflow is uh, you can just, for example, search for a location. So I'm going to search for Lone Rock, um, and I can select that area. And so you can find different areas. And then the idea of why we call it product on demand, normally um, there's a set of, we talked a little bit about the out of the box print service, standing up your own print service. You know, there's this very much this concept of a map document or a template, right? Where there's this particular layout, there's a particular uh, where the map sits, there's a particular scale, there's a particular location where all the elements need to sit on the page. We call those, instead of calling them templates, uh, when you're a user, we, we call them products. And so that's where the name comes from in terms of product. So we've got a couple of different sample products here. And the one I'm going to pick is a, just a more of a less a, a topographic example, which has a standard scale of 25K. So we call it a fixed 25K product. So I can select that 
and these uh, these dialogs are all configurable. There's a JSON file that sits behind this that allows you to extend, for example, uh, which exporters you want to support. So, for example, PDF, JPEG, you want to have uh, a, you know, a smaller list, you can you know, remove some of these as well. You can also expose other parameters. So for example, this, is, this particular product, we don't want the user to change the scale of the map, so that's hard coded in here. And we don't want them to change the page size. But these can be exposed as well, so you can make it really configurable and let the user have as many options as you choose to when you're defining the types of maps. So uh, I've picked PDF as a, as a sample output here. When I've loaded that, it actually loads up a map service that actually shows the extents of where, in this particular example, the forest service has data over. So these are the areas that I can actually create a map for. So let me zoom in here a little. So as we zoom in here, uh, what you can kind of see in the way that this application is set up in this sample map service is all these polygons represent what I would call the traditional map sheet boundaries. So I can select these, for example, and again, these would represent the, uh, the standard map sheet extents. And as I do that, uh, over here, uh, there's kind of a, an export queue. So I'm kind of queuing up the number of maps or the maps that I would like to generate. So as it's doing that, it's actually generating a quick preview of what that map is going to be. So I can actually view the type of map, and it just brings up a really kind of low res thumbnail, but you can kind of see the geographic area and what the layout of the map is going to look like. And again, we can look at these. And again, what these thumbnails look like and how true they are to the real map that's going to be exported, that's up to you. This is all controlled by the same Python script that's running in the background. We've just removed particular parts of the logic that aren't relevant. So for example, we're panning and zooming, and then we're doing an export. We're not doing a lot of the stuff with the layout. We're not generating some of the other information. But that's enough to give users a, an idea of geographically where the map is, what it looks like, and if it's the actual map that they want to generate. So once we do that, <clears throat> we could actually just click Export. But what I want to do is show a couple other examples here. So there's a series of tools that we provide. And again, this list is customizable as well. Uh, the first tool was just picking a standard map extent. What I can also do is do what we call a custom extent. So I can drop this down. And you can kind of think of this as a little bit like a cookie cutter. So think of your data as like dough, like pizza dough or cookie dough. And in the example of the Forest Service, it has these large areas. So what you can do is drop down an area, and then you can take this box and move it around. So in the example I picked Lone Rock, it just so happened, just for this demonstration, it happened to fall between a couple of map sheets. So what I can do is actually center my map right on that extent, and then it starts generating a preview for me. So what I can also do now is say, I don't have to wait for the preview. I can give it a custom name because it doesn't have a standard map sheet name. I'm going to call it Lone Rock. And what I'm going to do is click Export. So again, how this works is, again, behind the scenes, there's a seamless database that has data over all these areas. So we're not, again, constrained to the traditional map sheet boundaries. These aren't PDFs that are sitting in a file server somewhere. So that allows us to have this type of flexibility where I can change the position of the map. I could even change the size and the extent of the map as well. Because again, what's happening is when I click that export button, that map is being generated on the fly as we speak. So this one here takes about 38 seconds when I tested it uh, an hour ago. So let's see, here we go, 38 seconds still. Love that. And so now what comes back is um, the Python script, the GP service, has finished generating this map, and now the PDF that it generated is actually sitting on the, Arc on the ArcGIS server in the outputs folder. So what I simply do is click on this link, and I'm using Edge, so for whatever reason, Edge doesn't load at the very first time. So let me just refresh. And because we're in a browser and it's PDF, the browsers can read PDFs natively. Um, so just give it a second here to, for Edge to draw. So the, again, these, these maps are pretty complex. So it takes a little bit to draw here. I think they're, this one here is about 20 megs or something. So here you can see uh, pretty detailed cartography. Uh, you can see the custom name that I typed in. So this is Lone Rock. That's because I typed it into the application. 
that was a variable that I chose to expose when we set up this application and it gets passed into the, the GP print service. Uh, you can see the detailed cartography, the complex grid and graticules. Let me just scroll down here a little bit. And again, this is just a sample application, so there's a huge Esri logo on it. And uh, you can see some of the surround elements, the legend, and again, you can see the custom extent. So this is all, again, being dynamically generated, and you can check the time down here, right? So that's when we made the request. So that's kind of how the application works. And again, there's a couple other examples in here. You can do like map books. Uh, for example, you can uh, define a, uh, an area and it'll generate a series of map sheets. You can do it a couple different ways as well and define those extents. So let me jump back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So again, just kind of a quick overview of what's kind of happening behind the scenes. So you saw the final resulting PDF. Uh, again, it's a GP service. It's based on Python. And so there's a couple things. Uh, in this particular map where there's a, there's a tool called Grids and Graticules tool, which actually creates grids and graticules as features inside of the geo database. Fundamentally, it's a geoprocessing tool, and that's all you really need to know. So when this map gets generated, we're running a series of geoprocessing tools. So again, all the geoprocessing tools that exist, you have access to, and you can actually call them through a workflow like this. Um, this is called this is uh, this add grid data. This is a Python method that's actually in a Python site package that's part of the production mapping extension. So you have access to Python as well. So not only GP tools, but Python methods. These are dynamic. Uh, dynamic map surround elements. These are, these are examples of uh, specific map surround elements that are, again, a part of the production mapping extension. So if you have the production mapping extension, you can utilize those. But again, any of the other standard map surround elements, scale burrs, legends, any of those things that you stick on your map, those will update dynamically as well. So again, you pan and zoom, those elements will update, and again, there's no coding involved. It's just really setting up the MXD, the template, to include those uh, map surround elements that are dynamic. So uh, these elements, these are text elements. Again, we're just using Python here. We just use a search cursor on the text element using ArcPy mapping, and we just iterate through the elements on the page, and we just do some text manipulation. We hit the database, we find the values in the database that we want, and we just update. So it's just a simple kind of find and replace type of thing. The text elements are already sitting on the page with placeholders in them, and we're just doing a, a, a find and replace on the text element using Python. Again, this is an example. This is a slightly different example here, but uh, this is just a dynamic data frame. So there's an option in a data, so there's two data frames in this map. This is a second data frame. And this data frame, there's an option to follow another data frame. So when the main map moves around, the little red box automatically moves around for you. And again, that's just a property of a data frame. So again, no coding involved there. It's just setting up the MXD and the template to do that. And then it's setting up a, a layer definition on that, um, on that uh, data frame as well. And so then the last part is actually making the, uh, making the PDF file or the TIFF or the JPEG or the map package if you choose to deliver data as well. And again, that's just a, a simple function call to the map exporters, and uh, it just happens to be export to PDF in this example here. So uh, in the earlier slide, I showed you where the GitHub repo was. That's this configurable starter app. That's the same app that I just showed you. Um, now, the way that the sample app is set up, it's using um, a series of functions in the production mapping extension. I mentioned some of those. For example, uh, there's some of those surround elements, the declination diagram, the north arrow. Some of those are part of production mapping server. If you don't have production mapping server, you don't have those. But again, you have access to the standard uh, map surround elements that come with ArcGIS. Uh, grids and graticules, I mentioned that. That's how we generate those complex rules. Uh, for the grids and the graticules, layout rules, and map exporters. So those are all kind of enhanced feature functionality that's part of production mapping server, the extension, that allow you to build some of these more complex maps. But again, the basic workflow could work for, uh, for, other, for other types of maps as well.
So in the starter app, again, I mentioned it's Java-based. There's a configuration file that controls most of the UI. So all the dialogues are configurable through this, through this JSON file that you just need to update. And then if you want to do any uh, real stylistic changes to the web app, you know, it's JavaScript code. You can go in and do whatever you want with it, and you can modify the CSS. Um, but the basic workflow for changing the dialogues are just handled through a config file. But if you want to dramatically change the look and feel of the app, then just, you know, you're going to have to go in and make modifications to the HTML and the JavaScript. Uh, and then the, the last part that's up there as well is the GP service, which again is just a, a series of Python scripts. And again, that's all up in GitHub. So again, um, there's a little bit of production mapping server thrown into this demonstration. And again, these are some of the things that allows you to do. Uh, Behavior-based cartographic calculators, auto calculating the projection, the scale, the extent, the page size, some of those things. There are some advanced uh, printing and export options that are available with production mapping for server that are available through standard, uh, the standard exporters. There's a collection of specific surround elements. I showed you a couple of those. There is a additional site package that we deliver, which again gives access to some of those more high-end functions, uh, cartographic calculators, standardized symbology, a few things like that. And then again, I mentioned the, the JavaScript uh, sample app, which is the same uh, thing I just demonstrated. That's all I have. I have two minutes left. So uh, I'll take questions. If you have time, you've installed the app, you can, uh, I think you can review this demo theater and tell me what you think. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Let me, uh, I think how this is supposed to work is I'm supposed to give you guys the, the mic. So you get to, get hey. to talk to everybody. Hey there. Um, hey. Just wondering if you could take that sample application and wrap it up as a web app builder widget. Right. So the, could you take the whole app and actually widgetize it and put it in a web app builder? We started looking into that a little while ago. So um, in theory, yes, we haven't actually done it yet. The part of the difficulty with that specifically, yeah, thanks, if you can pass the mic around. Part of the difficulty with it is um, there's, there's, some, there's some hooks into the map services themselves which define the map extent. And as a widget is a widget, it doesn't necessarily know about other parts of the application. So there's some things in there that we needed to think through. But it's on our back burner of things to do. We just haven't done it yet. But yeah, we, we've heard that request before. OK. Um, in your workflow, when do you choose the paper size? When do you choose the paper size? So, so yeah, the question is, when in my workflow in this application, where do I get to pick the paper size? So in this pati particular example, Again, we have this term we call product, right? Think product of, as template MXD. So when I pick the product or the template, it's already defined on the server. So for example, in my example, I picked this fixed 25K. There's an MXD or a couple MXDs actually sitting on the server in a folder that already have that extent defined. So it's a part of the product definition, if you would. OK, so, well, Typically, our technical staff, they would uh, see, OK, today I can take an A4 with me, or an A3, or I can print a big map. Right. So in the workflow, uh, you have to take to, into account who, if, if they're working in a small office, or if they're working in one of the bigger offices with a big printer available. So, um, so what I wanted to show as well, if I can remember which one it is, one of these uh, dynamic area. So this is a this might better answer your question. So we have another sample which I didn't happen to show, which is again another product. And you can see how the dialogue is a little bit more customized here. We we don't only expose the exporter, we also allow the user to define the scale, and we have a domain drop down list on the page size in this example here, and we get to pick the orientation. So. This, there's samples of how we do this. Again, behind the scenes, what's happening is, uh, you know, a very simple UI. The Python script on the back end handles this, right? So if a user defines they want to pick A4, we'll set the page size to be A4. So there's a back end. You can either have hard coded MXDs to a fixed number of page sizes. That's what we've done in this sample. Or you can make it completely open and allow the user to type in. But then, obviously, on the back end of the server, you have to define the logic 
of what's going to happen when that page size gets smaller, you know, really big or really small, and all where all the elements go. But it is it is doable here as well. And the code for that is in the uh, startup rep yep. thing on GitHub. Yes. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. All the yeah. So the front end for how do you configure this, and then primarily on the back end, you can see the Python of how we handle this product as well. Yeah, and yeah, if you look at the sample, uh, we we have these names again. They're just kind of um, sample names, right? We have fixed fixed twenty five dynamic area, dynamic scale, and dynamic page can, size. Can if you, you look find, for, if find you, the um, the sample on GitHub? Because sometimes it's really difficult to uh, <laughs> figure out. Yeah. What so then, uh, the, I guess what I'm suggesting is we tried to name every, we we designed it as a sample for people to look at. So we tried to keep the names consistent. So if you get to the repo and you look in, inside the Python script or the configuration file, look for dynamic area, and you should see where that module is actually in the Python. Question in the back. Does the exported PDF support layers? It does, yes. So you can turn them on and off once. Yeah. How yeah. about Geo PDF? Yes. Yeah, so the question is uh, the PDF export, does it have layers inside of the PDF? And yes, it can. Again, that's really up to you as the configurer or the developer of the app. It's a standard function of the PDF exporters. So there's just an option in the PDF exporters to enable layers and attributes. And you can, again, in, in this example here, from a, from a web application point of view, we kept it really simple. But on the back end, for example, I think we've we've hard coded it to always include layers and attributes, and and have it geo referenced. But that's up to you to determine how you want the exported to work. But yeah, it is supported. Any other questions? No. All right. Cool. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>